So um, welcome everyone. Um, I'm glad to see so many people here. Um, I'm Sarah Horowitz. I'm from Haverford College and a member of the um, RBMS Instruction and Outreach Committee. And along with my colleague, uh, Rachel uh, Makarovsky, uh, will be um, sort of um, coordinating uh, today um, and um, helping um, to monitor the Q&A um, as we get to that part of the day. Um, thanks for taking time out of what I'm sure is an incredibly busy schedule given everything that's going on in the world and thinking about building and managing primary source instruction programs with us. We're um, so excited for this. Um, as I said, this um, is, um, let me see, this, um, this presentation is um, sponsored by the RBMS Instruction Outreach Committee. Um, and we want to thank ACRL and particularly Lois Sharp, the um, uh, a program coordinator who has helped us um, with all of our technology and getting this on the calendar and putting everything together. And so we really want to thank and recognize Alois for all of her work, which is very much appreciated. Um, we also want to say that this is the first in a series of two webinars. The second webinar on um, sort of the infrastructure administration of primary source instruction programs will be July 16th at 1 p.m. Central. Um, our speakers there will be Gabrielle Dudley from Emory University and Jay Satterfield from Dartmouth College. And so we hope that you'll mark your calendars and that you can join us at that date um, as well. Um, but for right now, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers um, this afternoon or morning, depending on your time zone, but afternoon for me. Um, so um, Matt Strandmark is the education archivist at the University of Kentucky, where he coordinates and delivers instructions, serves on the research um, services team, and um, manages the exhibit program there. Um, Christine Cheng, um, who's also a member of the RBMS Instruction Outreach Committee, is the instruction and outreach librarian for archives and special collections at the University of California, Davis. Um, there, she designs library services and education programs that help to increase the understanding of rare books, manuscripts, and archives. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to our speakers who will each give a presentation. If you have questions, um, please feel free to throw them up in the Q&A as uh, they occur to you. Uh, Rachel and I will be monitoring that and um, uh, the speakers won't necessarily respond in the moment, um, but we'll have a Q&A at the end after both speakers have talked. And so we'll be happy to um, sort of pull to the top questions that have come in through the Q&A process at that point. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Matt and Christine. Hi, everyone. So this is Christine. Before I launch straight into my presentation, since this will be the last time I look at the chat box, uh, chat box before my present, the end of my presentation, I just want to make sure that I'm coming through loud and clear. Can everyone hear me? Is my volume setting okay? Excellent. Okay, I'm going to start sharing my screen and then get started from there. This is okay. Hopefully everyone can see the play button. All right, welcome to my presentation, Getting Organized, Strategies and Tools for Beginners in Building and Managing Instruction Program. Since I'll be focusing on tools for getting people started with staying on top of their instruction programs and streamlining the instruction request process, we thought it'd be a good idea that I'd start first. I'm just gonna set my timer to make sure that I don't go over time. But before I launch into the meat of my presentation, let me just give a brief overview of the school I work at, of the department, of the Special Collections Department, and the side of the instruction program. Uh, University of California, Davis is a public research university. We have around 40,000 students, of which around 
31,000 are undergraduates. We got our start as a university farm school in 1908 until we became the general campus of the University of California in 1959. The size of the special collections department um, is around eight staff members. Um, in terms of our collections, our physical collections that are located on site, 10% of our manuscript collections are on site, 90% of our rare books are on site, everything else is off site at our um, storage facility in Richmond at the Northern Regional Library facility. We have over 183,000 volumes of books. Um, as of July 2019, 19,609 linear feet of manuscripts. Um, I think that roughly comes to almost either three or four miles of materials, which is much more understandable to the general public. As I mentioned earlier, we have eight, a total of eight staff members in special collections. Of those eight, two of them are temporary staff members. Um, and among that eight, we have three that are categorized as librarians, one of whom is a temporary staff member. We do receive and get additional weekly assistance from someone outside, um, from another department. He usually helps us with our public service by staffing the um, front desk, so reference hours. Um, in terms of number of researchers that we get um, every year and visitors, we like to focus on the reading room requests number. So fiscal year 2018, we had a little over 1,800 uh, reading room requests. Last fiscal year, we had a little over 1,500. Um, collection strengths, I mentioned we got our start as a university farm school. So we are um, and continue to be a major agricultural school. So of course, our collecting strengths are in the areas on the history of agricultural technology, agricultural and food sciences, and this is Northern California. So a major collecting strength in viticulture and enology, the study of grape cultivation and wines. We also house a number of research level collections in the humanities, such as the personal papers of Pulitzer Prize winning poet Gary Snyder. His papers are one of our anchor collections. Um, now talking about the size of the instruction program, that's pretty easy. I like to call it a, a program of the size of one. My position um, is a new position. I arrived at UC Davis in, 2000, in July of 2016 um, after a library organization or two and a few retirements from special collections. My, um, my position was created after consolidation in the areas of instruction and outreach. The number of sessions that I do every act academic year range from 38 to 54 out of 40 to 56 sessions. We do get a handful of sessions where uh, the requests ask to make use of the map collection. And for that, we have our map assistant who handles those, um, those queries. And we did have a first year seminar that occurred last fall quarter. Um, the library took on eight classes for that uh, class. The, my, the majority of my sessions are one shots, um, even though these uh, courses, request sessions, we have several sections, especially lately that have come in. I handle anywhere from nine to 11 sections within each course. Um, if the pandemic hadn't occurred, I would have handled 15 sections for a single uh, history course. Um, the, let's see what else, uh, level of classes that frequently come in are usually undergraduate courses, but nine to 12% are in the graduate division. My other areas of responsibilities besides instruction include reference, which I do twice every week. So that's around three hours. Usually it's more because uh, due to conflicts in people's schedules or absences. Uh, the length of time that I've been doing instruction in special collections and archives has been since graduate school, starting off with shadowing reference archivists at the National Archives and Records Administration for a su um, summer internship and doing semester long field experiences, a couple of them, at the special collections um, at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, that was in public services, in reference, and in instruction. And then my first job out of library school was at George Mason University at their special collections, um, doing something similar from a paraprofessional um, position uh, in regards to instruction and outreach, as well as dealing with document delivery and public services. Okay, let me get my 
make sure I get on the right page. So if you leave from my presentation, just remember you do not need any more than a handful of tools to help you get organized and stay on top and will build your instruction program. You just need a web page, form, agenda, and activity. That's it, we're done. I'm just kidding. Okay, so starting with the web page. Um, this is particularly important. You want to decrease the number of back and forth you're having with uh, people requesting sessions. This is where you have um, an entire dedicated page for instruction where all the information is available and accessible from a single location. This is where you state your purpose of the instruction program. Your um, Where you list your policies, set your boundaries and the planning. Um, you list the planning process. I like to list um, the purpose and vision for the instruction program and talk about how I see it as a research lab where students have um, opportunities to focus on hands-on learning um, experiences and developing skills and using primary sources. Um, I also make it a point to state that it's not only for um, instructors on campus, but I welcome opportunities for collaboration with people outside of campus. Um, it doesn't only have to entirely be about instruction. We also include other types of visits, such as workshops, assignment support, and group and small group activities. I list policies, such as I make it a requirement that I re um, need at least two weeks of advance notice, and I make it. I also make it a requirement. Um, before I schedule the session on our departmental calendar that the instructor um, submits a copy of their course syllabus. Now, when I say set, setting your boundaries, um, I mean encouraging, strongly encouraging consultations, especially with instructors you're working with for the very first time. This allows everyone to uh, talk about their expectations for the class, review the course syllabus, um, discuss classroom size and limitations, and select the best, most appropriate materials to use for the session. Um, I also make it a point to state that this is a collaborative process, a partnership. Um, both the course instructor and myself need to be present at each and every class visit. And if you haven't yet, I do recommend including language regarding accommodating ADA requests and other special needs considerations. Don't wait for that moment to arise, do it now. Um, and make sure that you, uh, everyone's aware of that when they arrive and visit special collections that there will be a standard 10 minute introduction um, that covers the department overview and handling procedures. Um, I list the pro planning process starting from when the requests are received to the date and time, confirmation of date and times by myself. Um, and I also list the expectations for the day of the visit, starting with student sign-ins, um, maybe even classroom preparation before their visit, such as having the students washing their hands before class begins. And then finally, a link to the instruction request form. Um, I think the best way to, for me to demonstrate and talk about the instruction request form is to show screenshots of my form. Um, I mentioned earlier cutting down on the number of back and forths, um, especially with a program of one, I need to get all the required information all at once. So anything with a red asterisk is required. I do all of my um, forms and my student assessments through Qualtrics. Um, also ask for if it's a course for UC Davis, affiliation, type of course, course name, how many students are in the course. I usually give about three choices for the preferred date of instruction, um, start and end times, and at the end, which is most important, that'll help me create the agenda and the active learning portion of the session, well, with lesson planning, are the goals for the instruction session. Um, and then after that, submit the form, and then I receive email notices to both my own email account and the departmental account in case I am absent for any reason. I'm not the only one who receives requests for instruction. Um, so for the agenda, this is important and is shared with the instructor at least five to seven days before the day of class. You don't have to have lesson planning started, but it will give everyone an idea of how class time will be spent. UC Davis is mostly on the quarter system, so the law school is on the semester system, but um, I just it's the quarter system. So a lot of these are one shots and a lot of these classes are 50 minutes long. I need to figure out how much time I'm going to assign for each uh, part of the lesson. Um, 
let's see. So you start off with listing the learning objectives. I'm always centering my lesson planning to what I want the students to walk away with at the end of the session. Um, it, any measurable outcomes, all of these are based on goals that you receive from the instruction request form. I list people role, people's roles, not only my role, but the students' roles and the instructor's roles, just to make sure they're aware that they have a part to play and also to make clear if they want more of an active role during the sessions um, or they want me to entirely take the lead in the session. So this is a way to confirm that role. Um, I break the session down from start to finish, starting with the self intro, ending with collecting the activity worksheets to share with the instructor later as PDFs. I'm just gonna provide an example really quickly of my agenda that I created for my medieval to Renaissance art course. Um, later on through the recording, you could take a closer uh, look at the details. This is a class where I had both um, an objective and a measurable outcome. Um, this is students getting equated with uh, a handful of uh, elements to a manuscript page. Um, this is how I break everything down, this 50-minute session. And from there, um, this is where I spend most of the time, the activity portion. Most, um, most of my time and effort is spent on this section. Um, so this is the lesson planning where I make use of active learning. That is the famous quote, any type of instructional activities that involve students in doing things and thinking about what they're doing. And one of the approaches that I like to make use of is backward design. It's easiest for me because it's already listed on my instruction request form. This is where you begin with the end in mind. You already have the destination set. All you have to do is figure out the various paths to get there. Uh, knowing what your end is is going to be will help you determine what uh, materials are you're, you're going to feature in class um, with additional input from the instructor that you uh, receive during the consultations. It's going to help you determine what questions you're going to ask the students to begin the process of uh, examining, evaluating, and analyzing the items. And it's also going to lead you to think about what other techniques that, what other active learning techniques you want to incorporate into your lesson planning. So in addition to backwards design, am I gonna use think, pair, and share with the students? Um, what sort of group exercises or inquiry-based, problem-based learning do I want to use? Um, what sorts of hands-on activities or even use of technology do I want to uh, incorporate into my lesson planning? Um, and also, you want to review the course syllabus to see if you can build off of prior knowledge um, just to see what the students have been learning. Uh, again, I'm just going to continue with the Medieval to Renaissance art course and show you what my activity worksheet looks like for that, um, for that class. And this is a class of nine sections. Um, I just give a brief description of the items that are um, featured on each, at each table workstation, brief um, directions, and then a handful of definitions um, regarding elements of a, of, of a manuscript page, and then the questions I wanna ask the students about, um, about the items. They select the items, ask questions about it. If there's time, I ask additional questions. Um, and if there's even more time, I throw in a couple of more definitions. Um, now, in doing all of this, um, just wanna talk about other things, other considerations, maybe successes. Um, I've been mentioning Qualtrics. I've, I've always known Qualtrics and I've been using Qualtrics since graduate school. It's all I know, um, which is why it's the first thing I uh, rely on. But uh, if your um, institution does not have access to Qualtrics, I've heard good things about Google Forms in terms of creating um, creating for, uh, regist researcher registration forms, um, instruction request forms, as well as for assessment. I, I believe you can create quizzes from Google Forms. Our library's website is built on WordPress, and so the subject librarians do have their instruction request form that they've used WordPress to create. Um, some successful and unsuccessful things that I've come across. Well, as you can imagine, with a 50-minute uh, session, it, uh, I don't always have time for assessment. Um, I do make time usually for the reflection portion, but I now 
find that now that instruction has moved online, those pieces are very important. It is hard to gauge your peers' reactions um, and responses to the items through the screen. So I just recommend um, making sure you include the reflection portion at least 10 minutes so um, students can get ideas what other people are thinking, how they're reacting. Um, for the assessment, it's at least for the first time that you hold your, um, your class online, it is, I would make it a requirement. The feedback you receive is going to help color and direct your future, your future classes online. Um, and an, another thing, well, being a program of one, I sometimes feel that I don't have enough bandwidth to do all the things that I want to. I mean, instruction and reference, they are forms of outreach, but I would like to do more proactive forms of outreach, such as um, getting in touch with surrounding primary schools, getting and teaching uh, elementary school students about primary sources uh, before they even step foot on campus. Um, and this is advice that I, that's more for myself than others. No matter how, how beneficial and how much inform, useful information you think you're providing, something will always go wrong. Um, I'm, I consider myself to be a pretty organized person, but just remember when things do go wrong and they will just to stay flexible. So again, four things. Your web page dedicated to instruction, an instruction request form to gather information, receive it all at once, your classroom agenda to figure out how you're going to um, plan for class time, maximize class time, and the activity where you can, form, you can uh, incorporate some form of active learning. Um, not all classes require an active learning component, but I, like, I tend to make use of active learning quite often. And in case anyone wants to look at my, uh, an example of my webpage or my webpage, you can go to this URL um, to see all, all of my policies and um, expectations that I have for my classes. And that is it. I will stop sharing somehow. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Christine. That was great. Um, and uh, again, before I get started, can everybody uh, hear me okay as well? That's probably a good idea to check audio. Yeah. All right, cool. I'm seeing mostly yeses. Um, so again, before I get started, I just wanted to um, thank Christine again because that's great information, outstanding uh, list of resources to put together, especially when you're thinking about the logistics behind how you start programs like this, how you maintain these programs. I'm going to go ahead and say that I'm going to be a little bit broader with what I'm looking at. So with that kind of intro, um, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen with everybody. And so um, basically what I'm going to talk about, what I'm going to cover is, is not looking so much at those individual, very, very important, but not individual kind of logistic parts um, of the program that we um, kind of manage and cover at the University of Kentucky. What I'm calling my presentation is Compassion and Nudge. And so that'll immediately kind of bring some things to mind for some of you. Um, but it is about building and maintaining an effective primary source education program. I'm going to apologize in advance that I'm not used to um, talking out loud anymore. So if I run out of breath, I'd have to pause for a second. Um, that's exactly why. So basically, um, our program overview. So again, I am the education archivist at the University of Kentucky Special Collections Research Center. Um, and I work as part of, the, uh, as part of the research services and education team, um, where I coordinate instruction services, I coordinate exhibits, perform outreach, um, do research service work, um, along with all my colleagues. And I have been at the University of Kentucky since November of 2015. Uh, and before that, I was the outreach archivist at Emory University's uh, Rose Library. Uh, so again, you saw Gabrielle Dudley coming up on Ju July 16th. Gabrielle is a close friend of mine, but also an amazing professional. So please uh, put that on your calendars as well. So a basic overview of our education program um, is that we see about 2,700 to 2,800 student visits per academic year. And that's been pretty standard over the past um, four years or so. And that's split up in usually about 115 to 125 different sessions. And these are all kinds of things. These are a lot of um, one-off sessions. They are return sessions. We see a lot of different uh, 
disciplines, a lot of different groups, and I'll touch on that in just a second. I, I have an assistant, so I, I have an education graduate assistant um, who I work with and who does uh, teach part of these courses and helps me a lot with the research and preparation for these courses as well. Um, but our classes are also taught and supported by the Director of Research Services and Education and our Rare Books Librarian, uh, who both are awesome and great to work with. Um, so we do have very strong partnerships. So again, even though we have a pretty broad representation of disciplines, classes, levels that we work with uh, at UK, we have very strong partnerships. So for example, with the first year uh, comp course for us, that is a, a department called Writing, Rhetoric, and Digital Studies. So um, that's required uh, for freshman level class, first year class that everyone needs to take. So we see a lot of those classes every single academic year. Um, we also have a strong partnership with the Honors College, um, which has been more recent, but we have uh, worked a lot with them um, uh, as, as they've kind of gotten their program started as well. So um, just to kind of give you an overview of what we see of, of what we're working with. Sorry about that. <laughs> Give me a second here. Oh, gosh. Okay. Okay, so again, what I want you to take away from uh, from today, um, and sorry about that, my uh, two-year-old uh, daughter just woke up from her nap, so I just had to pause for just a second. Um, what I want you to take away from today, five. basically I'm gonna talk about five examples. I'm gonna cover five examples of how cognitive science and particularly something called choice architecture can benefit um, your work. And I, and I hesitate to use this, but really what I want it to be is kind of a plug and play strategy, how you can immediately take these things, no matter if you are just simply starting um, starting a program or going into um, you know your 10th year managing an instruction program hopefully, hopefully a lot of these things can be useful no matter what you're doing no matter where you are so the things that you can use immediately um, I want you to also I want to help you uh, kind of reframe your approach I want to help make your life easier make your instruction more effective and I want you to, I want to be able to spark new ideas about how to contribute to student success by using these factors in cognitive science that I've kind of gotten um, really interested in and incorporating those into my instruction. So what is a nudge? Again, a lot of you probably recognize this right away. Um, if you've read um, Nudge, Improving Decision About Health, Wealth, and Happiness, which uh, was pu originally published in 2008 by Richard uh, Thaler and Cass Sunstein. And it's really um, a theory based in behavioral science and focused on ind individual behavior. Now, it's not like this book was necessarily about classroom learning. Most of this is about uh, politics or behavioral economics. In fact, Richard Thaler ended up uh, just recently in 2017 winning the Nobel Prize uh, for economics for his work on behavioral economics. But really the, the underlying principle here is that it suggests that positive reinforcement and indirect suggestion can influence people's decisions and, and uh, and actions without them even realizing it. So it's it's really, and that's kind of the reason why I put the compassionate nudge in the title of this is that I'm not trying to trick students. I'm not trying to trick faculty members. I'm simply trying to design uh, my program in a way that is gonna more easily lead to the outcomes that we're looking for. And that really what that means to me is how can I help students as much as I possibly can with, with the little amount of time that I see them, that I work with them. And almost all of this is based off of the work uh, done by Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky on heuristics. So a lot of you might recognize uh, that Michael Lewis wrote a book back in 2016 called The Unknowing Project about Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. And Daniel Kahneman has an outstanding book that I'd really recommend too that's called Learning Fast and Slow that was just uh, published a couple of years ago. So it really is a lot based on these these little individual nudges that help people improve their behaviors improve outcomes for themselves so some popular examples of nudges that you might have heard of before um, are things like actually asking people if they want to be organ donors so before this was done not very many people were organ donors until they started to put this question um, on like a driver's license application so that people didn't have to like go out of their way 
to volunteer to, do, to donate their organs. Um, we see this sometimes in places like grocery stores. So if there are green arrows, if there are pathways leading to uh, fruits and vegetables to the healthy foods, that is also a great, big example of a nudge. Grocery stores are also kind of notorious for using nudges in ways that don't help health, but we're looking at the, the compassionate side of these things. Uh, another great example of this was in the UK. They did this is called Little Bin Big Bin Program. So it's basically, they, um, basically what they did was uh, make recycling cans bigger than garbage cans and garbage cans smaller so that people were more likely to recycle and fill those up before they uh, used uh, garbage cans. Uh, we saw another study in the UK where people were asked if they actually wanted to downsize their meals instead of supersize their meals at fast food restaurants. And over 40% of uh, customers actually, when, when they at, were asked that, decided to downsize uh, their meals. And then even things as easy as litter and cigarette butts. So maybe some of you have seen uh, uh, sorry, sorry about that. Maybe some of you have seen um, examples of uh, cigarette butt um, uh, containers where you can like vote for your favorite soccer player or, uh, you know, that's, that's asking you to do a community survey or something like that. You probably have also seen this at restaurants where they will put uh, two tip jars out and they will have you vote for your favorite football team, your favorite baseball team, baseball player, basketball player, things like that. So uh, just to give you an idea of why they're doing this, it's because you're kind of, your brain is already programmed to respond to these um, kinds of nudges as well. Sorry. Okay, so the nudges and instruction, the keywords that I want to focus on throughout this presentation are simple, clear, honest, compassionate, flexible, and positive. Okay, so that's what all these things are leading to. Th these are exactly what I keep in mind anytime I am leading a class, anytime I'm planning instruction. Um, and the first example I want to talk about is specifically recruiting faculty members, so performing outreach. So especially if you're just starting to establish a program, um, we have to think about the biggest challenge for faculty members, right? And it is that they are human, right? It, the biggest challenge is time. It's always time. If you want them to incorporate you into their classes, make it extremely easy for them, right? So do the work for them in advance and plan your outreach timeline very carefully as they are starting to think about and ramp up planning for their courses, right? So an example of this, bad outreach, I would love to work with you. Here's our finding aids database. Let me know what might work for your course this semester. I can almost guarantee you this is not gonna work for outreach, right? Unless you have an extremely motivated faculty member. And this is simply because you are asking them to do too much work in advance before they come and visit you, right? So, and here's an example of, um, of what I consider good outreach or the outreach that we try to do, right? So I'd love to work with you and your students this semester. I found three collections that would be perfect for your course learning outcomes. Here's an example of an exercise, on and on and on. You have already done this work. They can simply plug it in into with the syllabus that they've already thought about, discuss the logistics with you, a lot of these things that Christine mentioned already, um, and then you're good to go, right? So remove those barriers of entry, make it easy for them to say yes. That's really what this is all about. And a good example of this from the book, uh, from Nudge is a 401k contribution. So they did not used to automatically ask people, uh, automatically opt people into contributing to a 401k plan. So that is a, is a fairly recent thing. That automatically happening, it's driven up uh, retirement savings uh, exponentially. So that kind of idea to remove those barriers to make it easy to take advantage of that inertia. Um, also designing your outreach in a way that leads to your intended outcome. Again, all this is designing choices in ways that lead to positive outcomes uh, for you, for your students. So the example, next example, is really focused on working with what you have and not necessarily what you want, right? So I am not <laughs> discouraging you from uh, doing awesome things, right? There are so many um, talented professionals who are doing way more innovative things than I could even imagine doing who are a lot better at this. But I will say, be creative, be passionate, be awesome, but also don't be overly aspirational, right? Meet your students where they are, work with the reality of the situation, use that to your advantage. Um, and a lot of this is identify with their incentives, right? Understand where they're coming from. You're not going to always get students 
uh, by trying to inspire them with the magic of uh, these historical artifacts and things like that. It, it will happen sometimes. It's not always going to happen, right? So be open, be transparent, be vulnerable with your students about where you're coming from and focus on skills, right? Say how you can help them. You're using this content as a tool. You're not necessarily uh, depending everything on the all factor of this one thing that you're looking at or that they're working with. Gosh, I'm sorry, my presentation keeps messing up here. Okay. Um, so like this is an example of something that I say in classes pretty often. I know that all of you have probably taken history courses but that are boring or tedious. I have too. I'm not trying to turn you into history majors or archivists or librarians as exciting as I make this look, right? We focus on the skills we're building that we're working on. Use these resources to make you a better problem solver, public speaker, researcher, on and on and on. Um, and a great example of this and another recommendation that I'm going to give to you is this book Range by David Epstein. We focus on this a lot in our program, right? We are focusing on developing and sharpening these soft skills. Range is a great example of this um, because it is basically encouraging people to generalize, right? A lot of the most important discoveries that have been made in the past are because people took things from other fields, kind of incorporated that knowledge into the things that they're interested in. And I try and reinforce that with students as well. Most of all, be positive. This is, I don't see this very much in our field. I see that most archivists, uh, TPS professionals are already really, really good at doing this. I see this uh, in burnout sometimes when I work with uh, colleagues in other parts of the university. Be positive, get in the right, right mindset before you, start to, uh, before you start teaching, right? Students can spot this from a mile away. If you go in with negative feelings, if you, if you go in and they maybe have some hint that you don't really wanna be there, it's gonna almost entirely zap the energy from the room, right? And there are a lot of misconceptions about Gen Z, uh, Gen Z uh, about students today. A lot of this has to do with uh, things like technology, about eye contact, right? Just because someone looks sleepy in class, just because someone is not making eye contact with you does not mean they're not listening, does not mean they're not engaged. It means they have a lot of stuff going on. They're trying to manage a whole lot in their lives. And I have had students where I've gone through a class and they've been almost half asleep and I'm like, oh man, they didn't get anything from this. They come up at the end and they ask these outstanding questions. They're really interested. They want to work at special collections, right? So don't just assume things about your students based on body language or things like that because that is not really how it operates anymore. And and the bottom line of all of this uh, is that if nothing else, if I fail at everything, if nobody gets anything from the class, except when those students leave, they remember coming to this library, they remember that I am here for them, that I'm here to support them, I'm here to help them, I'm rooting for them, and that uh, then that's a success, right? That, that alone is enough uh, to count a class as a success. I just want them to know that I'm a resource for them. And I say this pretty much every class, I say, I have a job uh, here because you go to school here, right? I provide a service to you. I'm rooting for you. I'm here to help you. So please keep that in mind. Um, the third example is really to offer choices to improve learning agency. And this is a big thing for me. Um, uh, because of personal faults where I uh, don't often like being told what to do, right? So some of you might identify with that as well. But choice is extremely important in motivation. And pretty much every study of cognitive science, uh, behavioral science kind of reinforces this. Students are much more likely to actively participate if they play a part in choosing how they learn. Right, so be flexible, turn over some of the control that you have as an instructor, and it helps a ton with less interested groups or classes. And some examples of this, some examples of this are, uh, I will say to, the, I'll, I'll come up with two exercises for a class and let them choose one, right? Or I'll say, let's vote. Would you all rather work in pairs with one of these documents or work in groups of four with multiple documents? As I get the collections ready, discuss with your group whether you would like to work with letters or photographs and let me know as I come around with the handout. It doesn't really matter to me what they choose, right? I'm happy if they'll choose to do anything, but if they have a choice, if they are actually choosing something they think, they think is better um, than the alternative, and then they are much more likely to be engaged. Um, so if you find if you find yourself struggling with classes that are that are not interested, uh, try this uh, strategy. Also, phones are here for good, right? I I'm uh, done with trying to get students to put phones away. I don't even ask faculty members to do this before classes start. Right? Incorporate that. Use that to your advantage. Incorporate questions that encourage your students to kind of supplement the research of what they find on social media, what they find online. 
add questions into your worksheets that include this because they're going to have their phones out no matter what. And I'm, I'm totally fine with that. Uh, a good example of this from Nudge is the decoy effect, right? So a lot of you have probably been to a fancy restaurant where they have something on the menu that's maybe like twice as expensive as the next, <laughs> as the next most expensive thing makes you a lot more likely to be okay with spending a lot of money on the second most expensive thing, right? So again, I don't care what exercise they choose. I don't care what collection they choose, but them having a say in it is going to make a big difference in how they participate and how actively they are engaged in the session. Uh, the fourth example is all about priming and social norms. And I want to be clear about this is that I'm not, I'm not talking about lying to your students again. Above all, this is about maintaining honesty, but prime your students for the results that you want to see, right? You're not tricking them, but simply be insightful from past classes or even your own experiences when you've worked with these collections. So know the collections you are using, right? Know them very well so that you can kind of identify uh, with them uh, to the classes that you're working with. And social norms are extremely important, right? Make sure students know how others have succeeded. A good example of this, a good example of this uh, is to be upfront about how other classes have worked with them, right? So the last class struggled at first, but they ended up finding some really interesting things about bias in these sources. That's going to make the next class much more likely to be able to pick those out and find those things. The same thing, I know there are quite a few materials to go through here, but we found some real gems buried in these materials. Look especially for ones that mention dot, 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 right? So you're already setting them up for success, priming them for what you want them to find in these exercises. Um, a good example of social norms is something like this. And this is actually a picture uh, I took uh, that we got a ma in the mail a couple of years ago, um, uh, which I was thought was a bit invasive, but right, but this the idea of a voter report card, right? We see this a lot where, um, they will say basically your neighbor, your neighborhood grade is A, but your grade's only B plus, right? All your neighbors are voting that makes you a lot more likely to vote. And that's kind of what we're talking about with this kind of these setting up these social norms, let them know the expectation is for them to succeed, to find things that are actually really interesting. They are much more likely to do that. Um, also be simple, be transparent and communicate, right? So there's so many great examples of exercises, teaching strategies in our community because we have so many outstanding professionals, again, who know a lot more about this stuff than I do, but please keep it simple, right? avoid overly complex situations. Unless you are extremely knowledgeable, you've been doing this for years and years and years, you know the ins and outs of every piece of, uh, every document that you're working with in these classes, avoid those overly complex situations and be transparent with your students, right? What are they there to learn? And I start with what I call the what, why every time with this, right? And I know I'm running a long time, I'm almost done. Uh, what are we doing and why are we doing it, right? So. I, I put this up on the slide. I say, you know, uh, what collections are we using? What questions are we answering? Uh, and then I say, why are we doing this, right? How does this relate to what you guys are doing in classes to the learning outcomes that your faculty members want you to focus on? And this is also very important when you're working with faculty members, right? So do not overburden them let them see you as a help, not as extra work. Kind of going back to the first example that we talked about. Be concise in your communication. Follow up regularly. Be, uh, use the syllabus to your, uh, to your advantage to be able to follow with them in the intervals that are actually helpful to them as they lead into different parts of their classes. When you do assessment, it's very, very important, as Christine was talking about, aim small, right? Don't assess every single class that you work with. Uh, don't ask a million questions. Make it short and simple and targeted so you can get actual data that's going to be important to you so that people will actually respond to these surveys. Build your relationships with faculty members and anticipate their needs, right? Do your research, do your homework, understand that they are humans, that they're running low on time just like we are, and help them along the way as much as you possibly can. And so again, just to wrap up, Throughout all of this, right, no matter what you're looking at, these logistics, whether you're looking at these kind of much broader uh, behavioral terms, be simple, be clear, be honest, be compassionate, be flexible, and be positive. And if you do those things, if you keep those things in mind, I mess up all the time when I work with classes, but I still consider myself uh, to be successful in the role that I've had so far. And I have great relationships with faculty members and with students because I try and keep these things in mind, right? At the very least, I want students, faculty members to leave knowing that I uh, adhere to these six principles, that these are very, very important to me. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you as well. Sorry for some of the technical and uh, nap glitches. So I appreciate it.
Thank you so much, Matt and Christine. Um, we're great. Um, and uh, Rachel and I are now going to, um, I, I think, grab some questions that have already come in as you're coming up with other questions. If you could please go ahead and um, put them in the chat, everyone. Um, and um, we'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, I'll start off um, with one um, uh, for, that came in for both of you, um, which would uh, just be, um, you know, have you um, had a chance to sort of work on any of this in, in an online environment and has that changed um, sort of some of the work that you're doing? Um, the, for myself, the instruction process is still the same. Um, and the only, you know, I would have had a lot more classes. I only had one online instruction session this past quarter. Um, I, it, it required more than two weeks for sure to do lesson planning and trying to take the active learning portion online um, uh, required some thought and I got a lot of helpful tips and suggestions by joining the TPS community call, um, making use of tools that I learned through there. And I created my presentation today through Adobe Captivate. So forcing myself to learn various tools and programs that I can use for asynchronous teaching. But um, it just, for my first and only online instruction session, it just required a lot more time. And um, it also includes digitization too. I had to digitalize, uh, digitize most of my materials for the session. Yeah, and I, uh, I had really, ex except for four or five sessions towards the end of the semester, uh, kind of when campus shut down, I had completed most of my um, instruction for, for the spring semester. So I haven't had run into that too much other than providing kind of online support for faculty members for classes and fielding student reference questions. Um, I'm anticipating that that's going to be more difficult uh, this summer. And as Christine just mentioned, I, I can imagine it's so much more kind of um, advanced work before you head into these things, right? If you're having to kind of build online modules, if you're having to kind of anticipate these needs before you get to that point, I'm sure I have a lot of learning to do to be, to be able uh, to be able to do that. We're at, at the moment, I guess our campus is planning to be um, uh, at least mostly in person or at least some have a kind of a hybrid environment for uh, fall, but we are still not going to be working with uh, students in our library. So hopefully that makes it a little bit easier to have access to collections while we're actually like there on site, but I'm still going to have to manage it as we go through. I think a lot of that's going to relate back to kind of what I was talking about with assessment. I'm not going to work with as many classes as I usually do. I'm, I'm going to be very targeted in what we do with our classes, uh, what we focus on, simply because the capacity is going to be a lot lower than as if I was kind of business as normal teaching these classes, uh, you know, in, in the classroom, seeing these students face to face. So I, I don't have a lot uh, constructive to say uh, about what I've done so far because I haven't done very much, but I'm obviously anticipating a lot of these things as we kind of go into uh, summer and lead up into fall semester. Great. Um, there have been a number of questions about um, sharing of um, uh, slides and everything. And so um, I'll let Matt and Christine speak to whether they would be willing to share their slides. But I do want to say that this presentation is being recorded and that recording will be shared also. So you will definitely have access to that. Um, so we've been seeing a number of questions in the chat there. Um, let me see. Um, Oh, uh, one question maybe uh, for Christine that came in is um, about the question of forms. Um, and somebody was wondering about whether um, there's any ever been in a perception by faculty or folks wanting to set up visits that the form is a barrier um, and that might discourage people, um, I guess. Not very often. Um, we did have, I did have an instance where uh, the, the faculty member, uh, you know, is perfect. Uh, we closed at five. He showed up at 4.59, asked if we could do a session on this day. I think I've already closed my computer. I'm like, ah, just, you know, fill out the form that you filled out the quarter prior. Um, and he just said, oh, you know, we'll, we'll do it next time. So there have been uh, less than a handful of instances where um, 
it was some uh, people found it hard. Uh, there was a case where uh, on my site, I did have links to uh, our special collections uh, request system, which is Aon, if you're familiar, if anybody's uh, part of Aon. Um, it's, a, it's what you use to request items and materials. And I had a faculty member that uh, was just looking for something that accepted her information and used that to request a class. So I just took the link away. <laughs> I just have one link to a single form so that nobody can ever make ever make a mistake um, about submitting a, an instruction request form. All right, thank you. This is a question for Matt. Um, someone was interested in what you said about offering choices to your students. Um, does this put extra burden on you as the teacher in order to plan multiple document sets or multiple ways of working with those documents, um, particularly with your example of, do you want to look at letters or photos? Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, sure. I, I would say from time to time it does, uh, it adds um, a bit, a lot, of, a lot of times where I would offer those choices or especially, I, so I was talking about maybe classes that are there for the first time or first year classes are not necessarily kind of like specialized or or super engaged with uh, with the material. So a lot of that I can do in advance, right? So it's not like for 20 different class sessions, I'm having to come up with, you know, two to three options for each one. It's generally if I'm gonna, if I know I'm working with say 10 English, uh, 10 uh, fresh fr first year comp classes in, in the first couple of weeks of the semester, I can come up with two exercises that used different sets way before they're ever in the door or even, you know, even before classes start offer both of them as kind of a way. So as, so again, I, I didn't mean to be misleading with that, but basically what I was trying to say is when you're doing that advanced work, go ahead and do two exercises and offer the choice, right? Because chances are you're going to have to use, uh, you're going to take advantage and use that work no matter what for future classes. And, and probably a lot of you have seen this, especially if you work with a lot of classes. I will have something that I did with the class like three years ago as I'm planning for this new class, a faculty member will say something and it'll just kind of like spark in my mind like, oh yeah, I came up with this one worksheet. I work with these one documents, these materials. So it has not been been too much of a burden to kind of stitch a few of those things together to offer those choices. So I wish I could say that I'm like, you know, they're 12 hours a day and like coming up with endless exercises for endless options, but that's not really what I'm doing. I'm just trying to be efficient with what I've already kind of developed to be able to offer it to the classes in that way to kind of take advantage of that, uh, that choice motivation that we, that we talked about. Great, thanks. Um, so question for both of you. Um, a number of people have asked sort of um, variations about um, how often um, your work sort of teaching one shot instructions um, might convert into more in depth working with archives projects, either where students then come in to fulfill an assignment or where you might work one on one um, with a student for an internship or a senior project or where you might develop a more in depth collaboration with a faculty member based on an instruction session. So what's the question? Um, how it how they differ or wh what we well, how, how How does that happen for you? Has it um, with some frequency? Never? Is it sort of, um, you know, your instruction program is pretty set? Or do some of these other things tend to develop out of that instruction program? Um, there are cases, a few cases, it doesn't happen very often where I do have follow-up visits either to, um, in the reading room or uh, follow-up uh, classroom sessions. So I do welcome those, you know, any type of collaboration um, either with assignments or w on a quarter-long project for sure. Yeah, and I would say this happens pretty often. I wouldn't say that it's it's necessarily limited to within that same um, academic year, within that same semester. So a lot of times, if it's my first time, like if I've done outreach and it's the first time working with a faculty member and they come in with their class, um, you know, it's it, if it's a one-off, that's fine. If it's just kind of wrapped into there as one little session in their syllabus, that's great. But a lot of times they'll come in, they'll realize kind of more about what we're 
getting at with with our with our program um the 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 kind of different kinds of collections that we have that they can like actually you know communicate with me as a as a colleague and then that will kind of spark things later on especially as they're coming up with new ideas for courses if they're um if they teach a different course and they, they'll say to me oh i didn't know this was possible I'm, i want to do this next semester with this other class that i'm teaching so i see that fairly often kind of as a progression of working as a partner uh, with faculty members more so than within that same semester. I don't know if that quite makes sense, but that's that's been my uh, my experience with it. Um, so another question that's coming is um, whether um, either of you have a um, sort of uh, p an assessment piece that you might recommend, um, particularly something that's really good for its simplicity or uh, ease of use, if you have a favorite technique, perhaps. When I was uh, doing classes on site, I did the, you know, the three, two, one, real quick and dirty assessment where you list three things that you learned, two things you like to learn more about, and one thing that you would change differently. Um, for online environment, I uh, learned about from someone else, the two, two, one, so one less one less thing for the uh, students to um, to add. Um, so two two one assessment that I do through Qualtrics. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I I I'm so this is something I'm not very good at. <laughs> if I'm being quite honest, that my uh, my supervisor Jay Marie Bravent is kind of an assessment. Um, wizard and is a lot better at this stuff than I am. So I depend a lot on them for, uh, for help with this, but we, we do almost entirely form uh, kind of formative assessment. So, um, either towards the end of the semester, if it's kind of a semester long project, or at least a few weeks after a class is visited, we do that kind of targeted assessment with Qualtrics surveys, um, as well. But, and again, uh, trying to be very succinct and brief <laughs> with the assessment and targeted because we um, based on other standards from throughout campus we used to do a lot more and a lot broader and it was kind of overwhelming and not um, that useful so I, I want to say too that I'm super thankful for all the work that went into the primary source literacy guidelines for all, probably a lot of you in this room were involved in those and so those have been such a great um, asset for all of us so that we can actually have assessment that make sense for what we're doing and that we can actually use to improve our teaching and improve our program. So thank you all for that is such an outstanding community resource for sure. All right. So this is a question for both of you. Um, did you learn about pedagogy on the job or did you have prior backgrounds in education or educational psychology um, or the like before you arrived in the archives profession? Uh, after I graduated from college, besides doing the uh, Japan Exchange to Teach You program, uh, teaching English to uh, Japanese students, no, no other training, but I got a lot of the tips and tricks, such as creation of the agenda, the instruction request form, and the activity worksheet through going to one of Robin Katz's um, all day learning workshops. I think she does, she does a workshop over designing for active learning. So she has informed a lot of the, of a lot of my work in um, organization and keeping on top and managing an instruction program. Yeah. And I'm kind of <laughs> not sure what to say about this. So when I was an undergrad, I started as an elementary education, uh, major and uh, quickly realized that I didn't want to do that. So um, I did have that at least some kind of kind of like baseline understanding of educational principles. I, I think it helped a lot. I was uh, I did a dual degree master's degree program in grad school. Uh, so I got a master's in history as well. And so I was able to be um, a, a teaching assistant for a year of grad school. So I was a teaching assistant for two different history courses. So I learned a lot from those faculty members. Um, I'd echo what Christine just said is that a lot uh, of learning from my colleagues, especially when I was at Emory University, learning from Gabrielle Dudley, uh, just seeing her work with classes, um, taught me a ton that I had no idea a lot of this stuff existed before. I'm still always constantly learning things and seeing how little I actually know. Um, so I think it has been a lot more less on theory and more on practice, kind of being able to witness it and then just trying it 
I, right? I mean, we've all done things that have not worked and I've done a, a lot of things that have not worked. So either just that process, the longer that you do it and just taking those risks has taught me, has taught me a lot that there are people who know a lot more about pedagogy than I do. Um, so, so I'm kind of impatient like that as a person that I would rather just go and try and do it sometimes to my detriment. So I'd probably be better if I learned, if I learned some more, but that's, that's kind of similar to how I kind of learned on the job, learning from people who know a lot more than I do. All right. Well, we are at time. And so I want to just thank Matt and Christine so much for their um, fabulous presentations and for taking the time to talk with all of us today and thank all of you for attending. I put the information in the registration link for the webinar on July 16th in the chat so you can feel free to grab it there. Um, we'll be hearing from Gabrielle Dudley and Jay Satterfield and I hope that you can join us then. Um, we will, as I said, be distributing the recording so you can go back and revisit these um, amazing presentations and um, We'll hope uh, that all of you are well and safe um, and your families are as much as is possible in um, this uh, very um, interesting world that we're living in right now. Um, so thank you so much for taking time and joining us today.